Hey, welcome to 12 Tone. A while back, I made a video where I solved what I considered at the time to be music's least important problem. I was very naive. For those of you who didn't see it, the issue I had was that there was no well-established way to describe this particular kind of melodic motion. And if it's not immediately obvious to you why this was such a big problem, then, uh... I'm jealous. What's your life like? I bet it's nice. Wanna trade? You could run a YouTube channel, I could do whatever you do, unless you're like a surgeon or something. That doesn't sound safe. Anyway, because I am who I am, I've recently found myself obsessing over an even less important problem, a truly trivial issue that absolutely does not need to be addressed, and yet, if you've seen the length of this video... <sighs> you know we've got some addressing to do. This issue has actually been on my mind for a long time. A couple years ago, I made a video about the relationship between G minor and A major, or more generally, the relationship between a major triad and a minor triad a whole step below it. According to some fairly well-established ideas in high-level music theory circles, these are the furthest apart the two consonant triads can be. I'll explain what that means later, but for now, just know that I found this relationship on my own, and I thought it was neat, so I wanted to make a video about it. But I didn't know what it was called, so I reached out to a friend of mine who had recently earned their PhD in music theory to ask if it had a name. And at the time, I assumed it did. There's a whole branch of music theory called transformational theory that's specifically focused on the relationships between pairs of chords, so I figured that someone at some point must have sat down and come up with names for all of them. There had to be a list out there, I just didn't know where it was. So you can imagine my surprise when my friend told me they had no idea either. I wound up making up my own name for it, so now it's called the exo chord, but it still seemed weird that there wasn't a list, or at least not a well-known one. I filed that away under projects to work on someday and moved on with my life like a normal person. Recently though, I found myself revisiting the idea after another similar incident. I was thinking about the relationship between two major triads a major third apart, like say G major and B major. This is an extremely important relationship in transformational theory, so surely it had a name, right? I tweeted the question and was again surprised to learn that no. Not really. Or, okay, yes, it sort of does, but that name sucks. You see, it's not quite true that there is no list. Over the years, a handful of theorists have built their own approaches to naming chord relationships. The most influential of these is probably Hugo Riemann's Systematik der Harmonieschritt, published in 1880. Under Riemann's system, G major to B major is called a Tertschritt, and that's still the name that's most commonly used today. The problem is that it literally translates to third step. The root of the chord steps up or down by a major third, and... That's it. That's all this name tells us. And that's super boring. I want drama. I want stories. I want a name that describes the actual relationship instead of just measuring the distance. Tertschritt isn't a name, it's just a fancy number, and we can do so much better. So... I'm gonna. I'm gonna name all the chord relationships. This might take a while. Before I get started, let's set some ground rules. First, I'm only going to be looking at consonant triads. No sevenths, nothing augmented, nothing suspended, just major and minor. This is partly for time, because this video is going to be long enough as is, but these are also just the most important chord qualities in most of the music I work with. You can probably expand these pretty easily to at least cover sevenths if you want, but I'll leave that as an exercise for the jazz folks. Second, I'm describing relationship, not motion, so I don't care which one comes first. G to D and D to G are the same thing, and they'll have the same name. Third, I also don't care about keys. If we hear G in A minor, we could be in G major, or A minor, or even C. I don't care. I'm only interested in that fleeting moment that exists between the two individual chords. I'm doing this because we already have some pretty robust ways to describe chord motion within a key. One of the main appeals of things like transformational theory is that it lets you step outside that framework, and regular viewers will know how much I love ignoring keys anyway. And finally, if these names are going to describe relationships and behaviors, then I have to make some assumptions about what those relationships and behaviors are. That's going to be based on my experience, my observations, and my background, none of which are universal. I'll do my best to keep them grounded in standard theoretical practices and to justify my decisions when I don't, but if the names don't fit with how you're hearing or using the chords, feel free to invent your own. I'm not the god of music, I'm just a doofus with a YouTube channel. With that out of the way, let's start with an easy one. The relationship between two different chords with the same root, like say G major and G minor. 
Oh, and side note, from here on out, I'm just gonna be starting every example on G. It doesn't matter, the same relationships apply everywhere, but I've gotta start somewhere. Anyway, G major to G minor is a parallel relationship. This is a pretty well-established name at this point, and it works because the two chords evoke parallel scales. That is, scales with different notes, but the same root. The G major chord implies the G major scale, and the G minor chord implies the G minor scale, both of which are G scales. So, yeah, parallel relationship. Easy. Done. Next, let's look at chords a perfect fifth apart, so some sort of G chord and some sort of D chord. As a category, I'm gonna call these dominant relationships. Dominant is the fancy music theory word for the five chord, and we can read these two chords as one and five. I mean, we don't have to, again, keys don't matter, but even outside that framework, the perfect fifth is still a really strong interval, and it creates a powerful directional sound, which the name dominant captures pretty well. To me, there's two defining sounds in a dominant relationship. The first is, again, the perfect fifth motion in the bass. That's obvious. But the less obvious one is the half-step motion between the third of one chord and some other note in the other. We can see this pretty clearly if we look at G major and D major, which I'll call the traditional dominant. This is your classic 5-1 resolution, and it's driven by the F sharp and the D chord sliding up to G. This can also go the other way as a 4-1 resolution, with the G dropping down to F sharp, but because the third of a chord is so much more colorful than the other two notes, these two resolutions sound pretty different. They're both strong, but they've got their own distinct characters. On the other hand, if we use G minor and D minor, that relationship flips upside down. This is the minor dominant, and here the resolution goes the other way. Instead of being 1 and 5, they fit more naturally as 4 and 1, with the B flat and G minor dropping down a half step to A. Same concept, different directions. Next is G minor and D major, which I'll call the negative dominant. These are the chords everyone was talking about during those couple minutes back in 2017 where Jacob Collier tricked us all into caring about negative harmony. And to be fair, they're pretty interesting. If the characteristic sound of dominant relationships is the third of one chord moving by half step to the other, the negative dominant lets us do that in both directions. We have F sharp to G and B flat to A, so we get maximum resolutions all the time. On the other hand, our final dominant relationship, G to D minor, is kinda left out in the cold. Here, there's no half steps at all, no F sharp, no B flat. I'm gonna call this the subverted dominant. There's still the strong fifth based root motion, so it still feels like a dominant, but the resolution has a blunt edge. It's a lovely sound though, giving that hard dominant motion a gentle serene touch that speaks less of dramatic marches and more of relaxing pastoral scenes that move through time at their own pace. 10 out of 10 chord motion would listen to again. Next up, we have chords a third apart. We tend to call these medians. If the strongest interval is between the root and the fifth, then the third sits halfway between them. It's in the middle, thus mediant. There's eight of these total, which I'll break up into three categories. First, we have the diatonic medians. These are chords that share two notes in common, and they're weak because they're so similar that the second one mostly just sounds like a continuation of the first. Like, consider the traditional mediant G to B minor. When you move between them, the B and the D both sit perfectly still, and the G just moves a half step to F sharp. It's a very subtle sound, easy to miss if you're not paying attention. The traditional mediant isn't all that common, especially compared to our other diatonic option, the relative mediant. This is G to E minor, which is slightly bolder since it uses a whole step, but the reason we call it relative is because much like our parallel relationship evoked parallel scales, these two chords evoke relative scales. That is, they imply scales that have different roots, but all the same notes. The G major scale and the E minor scale are identical except for which note they start on, and the relative relationship uses that connection to make the chord motion sound incredibly smooth. From there, we have the chromatic medians, which share only one note in common. There's four of these total, which I'll further divide into two pairs. The chords a major third apart, including G major to B major and G minor to B minor, and the ones a minor third apart, like G major to B flat major and G minor to B flat minor. Notice how, unlike the diatonic medians, the chromatic median relationships are between two chords of the same quality. This makes them feel dramatic and exciting because they don't really exist together in any common scales. But as I mentioned earlier, these major third relationships are special because their voice leading is balanced. If we go from G major to B major, the B sits still, the G moves down a half step to F sharp, and the D moves up a half step to D sharp. It's the same motion in both directions, so on average, the chord hasn't moved up or down. And the same goes for G minor to B minor. Here, the D sits still, the G moves down to F sharp, and the B flat moves up to B. 
These are the only two pairs of chords that do this, at least in standard tuning. Everything else moves more in one direction than the other, but here they're perfectly balanced with neither one sitting higher or lower. As such, I'll call these the balanced chromatic medians, which makes the minor third ones the unbalanced chromatic medians. But there's a bit of a problem. Because these come in pairs, if we want to specify a single chord relationship, we have to also include quality. That means we're forced to say things like the minor, unbalanced, chromatic, median relationship, and that's just too many words. It's too many. I can't in good conscience leave it like this. We need some shorter nicknames. For the major thirds, that's easy. Instead of balanced chromatic medians, we can just call them balanced medians, or even just a balanced relationship. Again, this is a unique property. No other pair of chords does this. So yeah, major balanced, minor balanced, done. Easy. The minor thirds are harder, though, because being unbalanced is not unique. Most chord relationships are unbalanced, so we need something else to highlight. The best I could come up with is calling them modal medians because they arise from a process called mode mixture. This is where you're in one key, but you borrow chords from a parallel scale. So like if you're in G major and you borrow the three chord from G minor, you get B flat major. Similarly, in B flat minor, borrowing the six chord from the parallel major gets you G minor. This isn't a perfect name, because you can also find the balanced medians through mode mixture, but it does let me say major modal mediant, and that's just fun. Sometimes we have fun. If you have other suggestions, though, feel free to let me know in the comments. I'm not entirely happy with this one. And finally, there's the double chromatic medians, which share no notes in common. The first of these is G major to E flat minor, which theorists call the hexatonic pole, because it's the furthest point away in a hexatonic cycle, which... Yeah, I should probably explain that. Basically, we're gonna start with G major, and then try to get to different chords by only moving one note by one half step. If we move B to B flat, we get G minor. If we instead move the G to F sharp, we get B minor. You might recognize these as the parallel and traditional mediant relationships, and they're the only two chords we can reach like this. But let's keep going. If we take G minor, obviously we can go back to G major, but we could also take the D up a half step to E flat, giving us E flat major. On the other side, we can take the D in our new B minor chord and move it up to D sharp, making B major. So far, so good. Let's do one more. In E flat major, we can drop the G to G flat, making E flat minor, and in B major, we can move the B down to A sharp, which is technically D sharp minor, but that's the same thing as E flat minor. We go off on two separate paths that ultimately converge on the same point. This is a hexatonic cycle. It's a closed loop, and the hexatonic pole is the furthest distance along it. But I don't know how much that name actually communicates if you don't already know this structure, so let's dig a little deeper. We call it a hexatonic cycle because between all these chords, we're using six distinct notes. G flat, G, B flat, B, D, and E flat. We can arrange these notes to form our hexatonic poles, but we can also arrange them to form two augmented triads. And that, I think, is the secret behind this relationship. Each chord contains the shadow of an augmented triad buried within the other, and putting them together like this lets those ghostly dissonances shine through. As such, while hexatonic pole is a fine name, I'm gonna call this the augmented relationship because it's the only pair of consonant triads whose notes can be rearranged into two augmented chords, and I think that's neat. Our last mediant is G to B flat minor, and this one's weird. It's kind of like the opposite of the relative relationship. The two chords evoke two scales that are as different as possible. Much like the hexatonic pole was the furthest distance on a hexatonic cycle, this pair is the furthest distance along a much more familiar ring-shaped music theory diagram. The circle of fifths. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's a fine sound, it just doesn't have any tonal connection, and there's no particular voice leading relationship either, so it's not obvious how one is supposed to use it. Riemann himself described it as scarcely comprehensible. As such, I'm gonna call it the broken median. It just doesn't do any of the things medians are typically supposed to do. I was curious if anyone had ever actually used this chord motion in a song, so I asked on Twitter. Most of the examples I got were from pretty experimental artists like Radiohead and George. George Crumb, but it also kinda pops up in a Spice Girls song, so there's that. Honestly, stuff like this is why I wanted to make this list in the first place. It's easy to focus on the normal chord relationships, but going through all of them one by one can uncover hidden gems that might otherwise have gone unnoticed. And now, let's take a quick detour to the least common root motion, the tritone. There's three of these, G major to C sharp major, G minor to C sharp minor, and G major to C sharp minor. 
You might be wondering why I'm ignoring G minor to C sharp major, and that's because the tritone is symmetrical, it inverts to itself. If we take these chords and transpose all the notes up a tritone, we get C sharp minor to G major, and since we don't care which chord comes first, that's the same thing as this one. We already saw that. Anyway, these three relationships are pretty similar. Much like dominant motion, we're dealing with two characteristic sounds. The first is, again, the bass motion with its striking, dissonant tritone. The second is the voice leading. In all three cases, we have have the perfect fifth of G and D, moving by half step in opposite directions to C sharp and G sharp. These two factors are so clear, so present, and so powerful that it's hard to even really process what's happening with the thirds. There are extra little bonus notes not doing all that much to drive the harmony forward. No matter what quality our chords are, they all wind up sounding like tritones, so I'm just gonna call them that. We've got the major tritone relationship, the minor tritone relationship, and the mixed tritone relationship. Done. Let's move on. So, okay, we're in the home stretch. We've done fifths, tritones, thirds, and unison, so all that's left is motion by step. Again, there's eight of these, which I'll break up into three categories. The first and most numerous of these are the diatonic steps. Here, I'll use a slightly more technical definition of diatonic. These are steps that appear somewhere in the major scale. In these cases, I'm going to name them based on the mode they most strongly imply. A mode is just a scale that uses all the same notes as major, but with a different root. If you remember the relative major and minor from earlier, those were modes. Each note of the major scale starts its own mode, and each mode has a name. As such, G major to A minor is the major step, G major to A major is the Lydian step, G minor to A minor is the Dorian step, and G minor to A flat major is the Phrygian step. Now, those of you familiar with modes might be wondering a couple things. First, why did I call it the major step when, in modal contexts, that scale is usually called Ionian? And the answer is, I did it because I don't care. It's my list, I can do whatever I want. More seriously, though, I tend to find the distinction between major and Ionian more confusing than it is helpful. Like, Lydian is useful because we don't already have a pre-existing name for that scale, but by the time you get to modes, most music students already know about major, except now sometimes you have to call it Ionian, but it's the same notes as major, so... why? I mean, I get why, I know the historical context and I don't mind teaching it, but for practical purposes, I just think it's easier to call it major, and again, it's my list. The other question is why I chose to associate those specific scales with those steps. Like, consider G major to A major. I called this the Lydian step, which implies these are the one and two chords in G Lydian. But if we hear A as the root, they could also be the flat seven and one chords in A mixolydian. We don't care about keys or directions, so this interpretation is equally valid. Why not call it the mixolydian step? And yeah, that's fair. Honestly, it's kind of an arbitrary decision, and either way would work as long as you're consistent about it. I just felt like this approach did a better job associating them with the most appropriate scales in my mind. Your mileage, as always, may vary. Moving on though, we come to the planing steps. Planing is a technique where you take a single chord shape and just slide it up and down, like in those cool Phantom of the Opera style chord progressions. <laughs> Now, planing doesn't have to be by half-step. The main thing is that the chord shape stays the same and all the voices move by the same amount in the same direction, but the most iconic examples of planing are typically done in half-steps, and half-step planing sounds cooler than other kinds, so I'm gonna borrow the term to describe the relationship between chords of the same quality a half-step apart. This makes G major to A-flat major the major plane, and G minor to A-flat minor the minor plane. And finally, we come to our last category, the weird steps. Bear with me, we're almost done. There's just two more left. Our penultimate relationship is the slide, which is kind of like a planing step, but the two chords share the same third. For example, in G major to G sharp minor, we get that rising half step sound, but the B doesn't move. While stepwise motion typically sounds reasonably strong and directional, this hanging third makes the side feel almost like a mediant, at least in terms of how soft it sounds. The whole point of stepwise motion is that all the notes move, but the slide refuses to cooperate. It's not a particularly common chord motion, but again, I I think it has potential. That leaves us with our final relationship, the one that started this whole project, G minor to A major. According to the rules of transformational theory, or at least according to one of the sets of rules, this is the furthest distance between two consonant triads. I already made a whole video on what that means, link in the description, but the short version is this. If you go back and look at all our chord relationships, you'll notice there are exactly three of them where two of the notes are held in common. These are the parallel relationship, the relative relationship, and the traditional mediant. Because because there's such small changes, we can use these as like building blocks through which to construct the rest of the chord motions. Like, say we want to build
build a negative dominant relationship from G minor to D major. That's not an available transformation, so we'll have to move in steps. Starting on G minor, the relative chord is B flat major, which is a little closer to our target. Once we're there, the mediant of B flat major is D minor, and the parallel of that is D major. We manage to make it from one chord to the other in three steps. And we can do this for every one of our chord relationships. There's a total of 24 consonant triads in standard tuning, and with four steps or fewer, we can move from G minor to 23 of them. The only chord that takes five steps is A major. It's the furthest chord from our starting point. It's the exo chord. I should note that after publishing my initial video, another friend informed me that this relationship does already have a name, technically. In transformational theory, the web of chords you build by repeating these three transformations is called the tonnette, which is German for tone net, and since this is the furthest distance you can find on the tonnette, Scott Murphy dubbed it the tonnette's pole. It's not a well-known name, I could only find one written reference to it as an offhand remark in a book by Julian Hook, but it's out there. Much like hexatonic pole, though, I don't think it tells you much about the relationship relationship unless you already know this obscure music theory structure, so while it's a perfectly fine name, and shout out to Dr. Murphy for finding it first, I think I'm gonna stick with exochord. It just sounds cooler. And we're done. So what was the point of all this? I mean, look, I told you at the beginning there wouldn't be one, so I'm not sure what you want from me. I guess now I have a complete list that I can refer back to when I'm talking about chord relationships, which I do fairly often. And it was kinda fun to dig through all the possibilities and turn up some really obscure sounds like the broken median and the slide. So as much as this was pointless, I don't think it was a waste of time. Or at least, not my time. It was definitely a waste of yours. Sorry. And hey, thanks for watching, thanks to our Patreon patrons for making these videos possible, and extra special thanks to our featured patrons, Susan Jones, Jill Sundgaard, Duck, Howard Levine, Warren Hewitt, Kevin Wilimowski, and Grant Aldonis. If you want to help out and help us pick the next song we analyze too, there's a link to our Patreon on screen now. Oh, and don't forget to like, share, comment, subscribe, and above all, keep on rockin'.